Okay, we are getting into volume 11, aka part 3, volume 4. I already bought this one and the last one for vo for part 3, so we've gotten up to, up, up to volume 12. Okay, prologue. In the midst of a cool mid-spring breeze, Tuli was out and about shopping with her mother Eppa and her childhood friend Lutz. It was a tr tradition in Ehrenfest for girls to switch from knee-length to shin-length skirts upon reaching 10 years of age. Dang, she's only got five more years until she comes of age. That's insane. Which meant she needed to prepare clothes for her upcoming birth season. The apprentice contracts that started at the same time as one's baptism also tended to end when one became 10. A child would need to then need to decide whether they wanted to renew the contracts at the same workshop or move to an entirely new one. It was a significant crossroad, to say the least. Once her contract ended, Tuli would be joining Karina's workshop as an apprentice Laharl, the very goal she had been working toward for the past two years. It was currently only a verbal agreement, meaning they had yet to sign any contracts, but there was no way that the Gilberta Company or Karina's workshop could go back on their word when she was the personal hair stick craftswoman for Lady Rosemine, the Archduke's adopted daughter. Thus, she was preparing for the move without worrying too much about it. Next summer, I'll be a Laharl just like Lutz. It would mean saying goodbye to all the friends she had worked with over the years, but Tuli was working on, walking on air, having come one step closer to her dream. She briskly reached the city's central plaza before turning back to look at Effa and Lutz, who were following behind. So Lutz, where to now, she asked. We'll be ordering your workshop clothes, as well as the Gilberta Company apprentice outfits, since you'll occasionally be accompanying them to the temple as Lady Rosemine's personnel. It'll be easier for us to place their orders first, as that way we don't have to carry the other clothes we're buying today around with us. That's why we'll be starting with Karina's workshop. At Benno's request, Lutz was accompanying Tuli today. She thought it was really impressive that he was always looking after others and helping them like that. Thanks for helping with this, Lutz. I know you didn't have to come. No worries, Master Benno asked me to, and I've got to get my summer clothes as well. Lutz took the lead, starting to explain where they were headed. Once they had passed through the plaza and entered the north part of the city, the atmosphere became noticeably more high class. The passerby were wearing visibly more expensive clothes, and their tones were much more polite. As she noticed, her mother looking around hesitantly, Tuli came to realize that at some point she herself had simply gotten used to going to the north part of the city. While she still felt nervous going into Karina's workshop, walking around outside wasn't stressful at all anymore. She giggled to herself, looking around as she continued to follow after Lutz. I wonder if other people mistake me for a northerner now. What's with the grin, Tuli? Lutz, Mrs. Karina personally invited me to join her workshop so that I could make Lady Rosemine's hair sticks. Isn't that amazing? Any apprentice knew what a proud achievement it was to have another workshop specifically ask you to work for them. Lutz congratulated her with an amused smile, but Effa looked a little exasperated. Tuli, you shouldn't say things like that in public. Other craftspeople would certainly empathize with how significant it was for Tuli to be scouted, and her co-workers always had a point to celebrate the apprentices moving to new workshops. But she was a poor southerner moving to a rich northern, or northern workshop, something that barely ever happened. It was likely that she would attract more envy than sincere praise for good, her good fortune, and in such a cramped city, it was much easier to live if you avoided attracting unnecessary resentment. Tuli puffed out her cheeks in response, I know, I know, but what's the problem? Nobody around here even knows us. She instinctively knew that this wasn't something she should openly talk about, even to her friends, which was why she had refrained from bragging no matter how much she wanted to. When people asked what her plans were, all she could do was respond with vague answers. Lutz has already joined the Gilberta Company, so I should at least be able to talk to him about this. It's not like I mentioned it around the neighborhood. How can I go on about joining Mrs. Karina's workshop when, Lutz, when Laura is upset that she might not even be able to stay at our current one? Everyone in Tuli's current workshop knew that she was often invited over by Karina to make hair sticks so they could certainly piece together where she was moving if they thought about it for a second. But even then, she had tried to avoid outwardly saying it to anyone besides her family. Yeah, Laharo contracts are a big deal to anyone who's worked hard for them. But you can't really talk about them when others are having a hard time just getting their current contracts renewed. Since I'm already a Laharo and won't be changing stores, I can't say I understand how rough the envy gets for people who are changing work workshops, but I get that you've been working hard, Tuli. Lutz spoke without a trace of resentment, and his words helped ease Tuli's heart just a little. She had always kept her silence when people started talking about their contracts, but even then, they often looked at her with jealousy. The fact that Lutz was treating her the same as always was a relief. You might not know how hard it is to change workshops, but you still really struggled at first, right? Tuli asked. 
Right after his baptism, Lutz had joined a big store in the north gate of town as an apprentice merchant without his parents' introduction or any experience in the business to rely on. Tuli was getting confused by all, from all the differences just moving to another workshop in the same industry, and Lutz had been thrust into a new world at a much younger age without anyone to guide him. You know, Lutz, if you hadn't gotten into the Gilberta Company, then I wouldn't have thought it was even possible for me to join Karina's workshop. You really are incredible. Hey, that's all thanks to mine. I only got in because she negotiated with Master Benno, and having access to her workshop in the temple gave me a chance to prove my worth to the store. Lutz ca said casually as he looked at Tuli, My place as a Laharl is only secure right now because I'm their cup. I'm their connection to the Archduke's adopted daughter. I mean, sure, I worked hard as well, but yeah. Aren't you in the same boat, though? You were able to become a hair stick craftsman because mine taught you how to make them yourself. And now that she's asking for your hair sticks as the Archduke's adopted daughter, the Gilberta Company's desperate to get their hands on you. You're working hard to make the best hair sticks you can, for sure, but mine's the, only, the one who paved the road ahead for you. Normally, nobody would entrust the crafting of a hair ornament meant for the Archduke's daughter to an apprentice who wasn't even 10 years old yet. Everyone wanted to personally work for the Archduke's family, so adults would snatch that kind of work away from kids by saying they weren't ready for it or something along those lines. The only reason the Gilberta Company hadn't done that yet, or hadn't done that, was because they understood that Mine wanted to see her family, and Les was making it clear that Tuli was only in the position she was thanks to her little sister preferring her hair sticks. Right, that's true, she replied. Tuli could remember back when Mine had collapsed all the time, barely been able to help out, and frequently ended up bedridden with fevers, and those memories were so deeply engraved in her mind that she initially found Lutz's words hard to accept. But her current situation really had only been possible thanks to Mine. That's why I'm not going to let anyone beat me when it comes to printing and paper making. You've got to do the same and hone your skills so that nobody can make better hair sticks than you. There are eventually going to be adults coming out of the woodwork who are better than you, and if their hair sticks are way more impressive than yours, then you'll end up losing her business. Were the Gilberta Company to sell the Archduke's adopted daughter infer daughter's inferior hair sticks while other noble women had access to better ones, it will be seen as a disgraceful form of mockery. Tuli, do you know what will happen if your hair sticks end up looking worse? I won't be able to see mine anymore, right? Nah, Karina and Master Benno would never risk angering mine by doing something like that. You'd still go to deliver the hair sticks, of course, but they wouldn't be yours. You'd have to get her ones made by someone else, all while pretending that you made them yourself. You wouldn't want that, would you? Tuli shook her head. That was the last thing she wanted. She once again steeled her resolve to keep working hard, determined to keep working for Lady Rosemine. Why, if it isn't Lutz and Tuli? Benno told me that you'd be arriving soon, a familiar craftswoman said as they entered. Karina's workshop. Lutz, you can handle the paperwork while Tuli and I go to the changing room to get her measurements done. You have other urgent errands that you need to finish today, don't you? The craftswoman swiftly guided Tuli and Effa to the changing room in the back. There were several seamstresses there who instructed Tuli to remove her clothes so that she could be measured. It feels so strange making work clothes for you after all this time. I mean, you've been coming here for two whole years now, one seamstress said to Tuli once she was in her underclothes. Effa smiled, sensing that Tuli was already welcome sensing that Tuli was already welcome in the workshop. We'll be coming to sign her contract at the end of spring. Everyone, please take good care of my daughter. Oh, we will. She's been coming here to teach us how to make hair sticks for years, but now we'll be finally working together. I'm sure it'll be wonderful. Tuli could feel her nerves starting to fade as everyone welcomed her with open arms, and the lingering fear that her joy was sure to be met with tragedy slowly began to ease. You'll need a Gilberta Company apprentice outfit for when you deliver goods to the temple, right? We'll go ahead and measure you for that as well, then. As measure after measure was placed against her body, Tuli couldn't help but feel a little strange. She had helped to measure mine and Bridget in the past, but this was her first time getting made to order clothes from a workshop. As a seamstress herself, she was excited to finally be on the other side for a change. Given how fast Tuli has been growing, we should make the clothes a little too big for her, Effa said to a seamstress. Otherwise, she'll soon grow out of them and we'll need to order new ones. Shall we make the skirt a little on the longer side then, a seamstress replied. Tuli put her clothes back on while her mother was busy talking to the seamstresses, and once the order was done, they exited the changing room. All done getting measured, Tuli? Come on, come here, then. The shoemaker's here. Let said. No time was wasted before Tuli was seated in a chair and measured again, this time for leather shoes. She desperately struggled to hold back her laughter as her ticklish feet were touched all over. Mine said the getting measured was rough. Now I understand why. Once Tuli had finished ordering the clothes she needed, Lutz, Tuli, and Effa went to the high-end clothes store, or high-end used clothes store that they had visited several times since mine first bought clothes for her there. Today, they were looking for things to be worn in the north of the city, namely a bodice and a shin-length skirt suitable for a ten-year-old girl. 
I've got to buy some clothes of my own, so let's split up and each get what we need. Let's say before promptly heading to the boys' section. Tuli moved to the girls' section with Effa, who looked visibly worried about buying clothes from such an expensive place. So, Mom, is this long enough? Tuli asked, showing her the skirt she had just put on. Bent, Effa bent down to get a closer look, then stood back up with an amused smile. That should work. It looks a little long on you right now, but come autumn, you'll be glad to have that extra length. Watching Tuli try on one skirt after another seemed to have made her a lot less tense. Now we need to get you a bodice. Hmm, how does this one look? Tuli took the bodice from her mother. It was like a vest, except the front was fastened together with lace, and girls started wearing them at ten years old to give them a prettier figure. She began to put it on, tightening the garment until it was pressed firm against her body. I'm assuming they mean a corset? Something like that? Because I'm assuming she's going to have to get something for her chest at some point once she starts going through puberty. I think I'll need a bit more practice before I can do it perfectly, Tilly mused as she twisted from side to side in a mirror, feeling a bit, little more like an adult than before. In her own opinion, she actually looked pretty good. As Tilly smiled to herself, Effa tapped a finger against the lace of the bodice. There's a knack for tying them so they don't come undone. What you've done here will come loose before the end of your workday. You'll need to practice before summer comes, but in any case, is this the one you want? Mm, I think this other one's cuter. What do you think? Tuli asked, holding up another bodice that caught her eye earlier. Effa's face clouded over slightly. It's definitely cuter, but don't you think it's a bit you much to wear to work? The two agonized over the choice for a while before eventually spotting Lutz dumping the clothes he had picked onto the counter. Tuli called out and started to wave him over. Lutz, Lutz, which of these will be better for a Gilberta Company apprentice? Since you're going to be a Laharo, you should probably get both. Both? But I don't need that many. I can make do of one, Tuli replied, but Lutz shook his head. As a Laharo, you won't just be going to the north part of the city whenever Karina calls you. You'll be living there. You gotta want, you're going to want a few changes of clothes, especially with summer coming up. It was true that Tuli would need several pairs of clothes suitable for her new living arrangements, but the thought of just how expensive that would be made... The blood drained from her face. She gloomily cradled her head while Effa stood in place looking visibly shaken. Who could blame them? These clothes were far more expensive than the ones I usually bought. Oh, you don't need to worry about the cost. We got a pretty big budget here, thanks to everyone's favorite money bags. Let's say pulling out a gold card from a guild card from somewhere beneath his shirt. It turned out that Mine had given him her entire savings from before she became Rosemine, telling him to use it to keep her connected with her family and to help Tuli achieve her dreams. Hold on, Lutz. How, just how much did mine end up making? Seems like she's definitely been adding money from her more recent earnings to it, so I can't give you an exact amount. Either way, she's making a ton more now that her work, work's expanding in scale, Lutz replied, averting his gaze as he placed the two bodices on the counter. Anyway, don't sweat it. Just buy what you need as you don't end up embarrassed when it's time to work. I'm thinking you'll need one more shirt, one more skirt and another bodice. Probably two or three blouses, too. At that, Tuli and Effa hurriedly went to fetch what Lutz had said they need. The small mountain of clothes on the counter was only getting taller, but Lutz seemed completely unfazed, casually asking the cashier to have it all brought to the Gilberta Company. Let's keep going. There's a lot more that we need to buy, Lutz said before once again walking ahead. Tuli was surprised enough that he was leaving the store empty-handed despite how much they had bought, but she was even more surprised that there was apparently more to buy. What? A lot more? She asked, her eyes wide, but we got all the clothes we needed. I just remember that you're gonna need work, new work tools and stationery. You're gonna need get a you're gonna get a room now that you're a Lahara, right? That means you'll need plates and stuff too. We could put this off until you've moved there, but since that's when you'll actually need it, but you can only use this card when I'm with you. So we might as well get it now. Let's took them to all sorts of stores, all the while thinking back to what he had needed to buy when he moved into his room at the Gilberta Company. They ended up with pen, ink, boards, plates to be used with other Laharos, and so on. There were all sorts of things that Tuli never would have thought to buy on her own. We owe you so much, Lutz. All this preparation really was beyond me, Effa said, shaking her head with a tired expression. She was glad that her daughter's dream to work at Karina's workshop in the north part of the city had come true, but it was completely unlike working in a poor shut workshop, both in terms of the clothes they wore and the tools they used. As a result, she hadn't known what Tuli would need, how much she would be paying for her supplies, or what the other apprentices would be using. She was nothing but grateful for Benno's consideration, both in sending Lutz over to help, and looking after the money that mine had left them. I never thought Tuli would be leaving home so soon, Effa mused, the reality of the situation only just setting in now, but they had bought so many household goods for the move. Once summer came, her daughter would be living an entirely different life, first mine, and now Tuli. 
Her children kept leaving the nest and a little sooner than she would have liked. I'm a little scared about leaving home, but I'll be fine as long as Lutz is there, Tuli said, patting her mother on the arm to console her. Isn't that right, Lutz? But much to her surprise, Lutz crossed his arms and frowned a little. I don't know. We might not be able to stick together for too long. Huh? But why? Are you going to quit? Tuli asked both her and Effa, looking at him with wide eyes. What was he even saying? The Hurls couldn't just leave their job. Lutz glanced around and lowered his voice. Can you two keep a secret? Tuli, I'm only going to say this because I know you're joining the Gilberta Company as an apprentice soon. After swearing them both to secrecy multiple times, Lutz paused, continuing only once they had gotten back to the poor part of the city, when those related to the, where those to related to the Gilberta Company rarely ever went. Master Ben was planning to step away from the Gilberta Company to make a new store that deals in paper and books. As it turned out, the Gilberta Company was making too much money from printing and paper making when it was supposed to be a clothing and accessory store. And since these thriving new industries had been actively started by the Archduke's adopted daughter, it was clear that they would only keep growing over time. Lady Rosemines caused the industry to go way too much since she was adopted. Plus, she's already proposed some original clothing designs that'll probably end up starting new fashion trends, hasn't she? Karina is still desperately finalizing the clothing design that Rosemine had given her for Bridget's outfit. And in the case that it became popular with nobles, the Gilberta Company's status will be boosted even higher. Tuli understood that. The other stores are pretty desperate to get on, in on these new industries, and Master Ben will sure got a stern talking to during the last meeting of all the large store owners. He's going to have to start a new store for printing and paper making so that he can split the profits and protect the Gilberta Company's share in the clothing market. Hmm? Isn't it good that he's making lots of money, Tuli asked, visibly confused? She didn't really understand why Benno had to protect his store when it was doing so well. Making money's great and all, but when it causes other stores to start getting en envious of you, that leads to problems. It's the same reason why, even though you move to a new workshop, is your move to a new workshop is good. You've had to keep reasonably quiet about it. Let's explain, which made everything click into place. It certainly was important to avoid making other people jealous. Plus, he continued, Master Benno's planning to take his new store and stick with Lady Rosemine, no matter what happens or where she ends up going. She's funding the entire printing industry right now, and she's his biggest customer. So nothing will start or move forward without her. Her passion for printing is more important to him than sticking to his home duchy. Ooh, that means if she leaves the duchy, he's going with her. So that means Lutz is going too. Nobles often move to other duchies for the purpose of marriage. And the same fate could very easily befall Rosemine since Ehrenfest was fairly weak compared to other duchies. It was entirely plausible that she might one day need to leave for political reasons. If such a case, Benno was prepared to join her personnel and relocate his new printing store to wherever she ended up. But he wouldn't be able to do that with the Gilberta Company, let's explain. They've got existing customers, connections, and a trusted reputation they can't just throw those things away for Lady Rosemine's sake. Karina, in particular, really cares about staying in her hometown, which means that if Lady Rosemine does end up moving else somewhere else, the Gilberta Company won't be following her. But I want to go with her, Tuli exclaimed. She knew that the Gilberta Company couldn't give up on everything it had worked so hard to establish here in Ehrenfest, but she was signing with them specifically so that she could keep being Lady Rosemine's personnel, not following her if she left would defeat that entire purpose. I guess I should sign as a Lahange instead since the Hurls are tied to their store. Nah, nah, nah. That's not what I'm saying here. We don't know for sure if she'll end up moving to another duchy. This is all just a maybe. Plus, you'll really want to sign as a Laharo if you can. It'll totally change how you've treated, and that's important for poor people like us who don't have any real backers to support us. Everyone will look at you differently. Lutz had gone from being a Lahange to a Lahara apprentice, so there's no denying that what he was saying was the truth. Tully grit her teeth. I mean, I want to sign as a Laharo too for sure, but my dream isn't to join the Gilberta Company. It's, it's to become a top-class seamstress and make to make her clothes for her someday. I promised her I would. What mattered to Tuli more than anything was the promise she had made to mine right before the Archduke adopted her. A gentle hand patted her on the back and she turned to see Effa looking down at her with a slight smile. Tuli, there's no point worrying about these things on your own. You need to talk to Mrs. Karina about this. We haven't signed a contract yet, so let's think hard about what, we, what will be best for you, she said warmly. At that, Tuli nodded, letting out a quiet sigh as they walked back home together. Never in her life had she thought she would need to debate on whether or not to sign a Lahara contract. Wow, so if Rosemine ends up leaving for another duchy besides Ehrenfest, for whatever reason, Benno's planning on going with her, no matter what. So that's why he's that's why he's making the paper the paper and printing the printing and bookstore because 
that's his mate that's the industry now and the gilberta company can't do that anymore because they're a clothing and accessory store wow okay so we know where beto's priorities are <laughs> a new dress lady rosemind shall we go to the orphanage director's chambers fran asked monica has gone ahead and prepared to welcome the gilberta company they had acquired some cheap cloth that would be pinned onto Bridget and then cut into a mock-up dress in a process known as draping. It might have been my imagination, but she seemed a little excited as we made our way to the chambers. I was excited too since Tuli will be coming with Karina. I get to see Tuli and Lutz again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for waiting. By the time we got there, the Gilberta company had already arrived. Benno, Lutz, Karina, Tuli, and several other seamstresses were in the front hall. We had talked about who will be coming ahead of time, but I was still surprised by how packed the room was. In all honesty, it felt a bit cramped. Once we had finished exchanging the standard greetings, I glanced over at Monica. Let's move so that we can begin adjusting as soon as possible. Fran, I shall leave you to look after the men. I went into the hidden room with Bridget, Karina, and Tuli, as well as the seamstresses carrying their the bundles and tools, following close behind. Please come inside. You may join us as well, Monica, as you wish. Since this was a fitting for a noble woman, only women were allowed to be in the hen room. As Bridget stripped down and prepared to be measured, the seamstresses busily moved about, spreading a large piece of cloth across the screen by the entrance so that nobody would be able to see inside when the door opened. Bridget had returned her light armor to the shape of a face stone, and with the help of the seamstresses, undressed down to her underclothes. She then transformed one of the face stones she had brought with her into something of a tight bodysuit. It would allow the dress to be cut without them needing to worry about the needles poking into her skin. This serves as the basis for knight's armor made from face stones. All students learn to make them upon entering the Royal Academy, Bridget explained, gesturing to her new attire. Even knights who seem to be entirely unarmored are in truth wearing one of these beneath their body armor, their, bo their flashy clothes. It seems that nobles always wore what was basically a Kevlar vest beneath their clothes. In less peaceful duchies, it was standard for even scholars and attendants to wear them to protect against surprise attacks. The fact that I wasn't required to wear one despite being a member of the Archducal family just showed just how peaceful Aaron Vest really was. I guess you don't really need bras and stuff when you've got a tight bodysuit like that, huh? I hadn't really spent much time alone with any older women since becoming a noble, so I wasn't sure what the underwear situation was for adult women. But if any everyone was wearing tight face stone bodysuits, then I could guess that they didn't need much support in the way of underwear. Commoners probably had more advanced clothing in that department, especially seeing as they already wore things like top bodices. Mmm, I don't know, this feels a bit... off. It wouldn't be very sexy to have a metallic face stone hardened over your upper body with a pair of drawers underneath. These thoughts were entirely founded in my time spent as a Rano, but long-legged beauties look best in garter belts, not floofy drawers. The thought had never occurred to me since I was too young for sexy lingerie, and even in my Urano days, I had never thought about wearing any. But now I was confident that this world needed an underwear revolution too. Seriously, the thought of such hot, full-bodied bays wearing lame old drawers is just plain depressing. Well, that's your bias, girl. But for now, my battle will be making, more fem making sure female knights had skirts that didn't flip up when they moved. So this was precisely why they found it necessary to wear such long, bland drawers in the first place. There was no point in me inventing sexy underwear if wearing it made them unable to fight. Practicality or sexiness? This truly is a question for the ages. Well, I mean, there is, you could have both, some for practicality and some for sexiness. So some that when you're not, actually, what am I saying? They're going to be wearing those bo the bodysuit things all the time under their regular clothes, so I guess... Practicality wins out. Anyway, while I was deeply pondering other people's underwear in my own little world, what the fuck is wrong with your head, dude? Karina and her seamstresses started pressing the cloth against Bridget. They folded it according to the designs drawn on the board, then began snipping away and pinning frills when required. Meanwhile, Tuli handed them pins, fetched when, when they needed, and carefully watched everything they did. I silently cheered her on, happy to see that she was trying to absorb as much knowledge as possible. I was also pretty curious to see Bridget's dress starting to be made before my eyes, but I couldn't just stare at the seamstresses the entire time. The process would take a while, and I would simply check up on them later when they were almost done. Monica, would you inform me when the cutting is over? I must discuss other business matters with Benno. As you wish. Monica opened the door for me, and I exited the hidden room. It was only Benno, Lutz, Fran, Gil, and Daniel waiting for me on the second floor, which meant I could act a bit more like myself without needing to worry. 
I shall join your discussion until the cutting is done. I said, sitting down and gesturing for Bennell to continue as I slip, sip the tea that Fran had prepared for me. First, I would like to express my deepest gratitude, Bennett began. Thanks to your assistance, Lady Rosemine, I am doing more business with nobles than ever before. Well, that was what he said out loud, but the look in his dark red eyes seemed to actually say, I'm freaking busy as hell now, and it's all your fault. As a merchant, he was probably happy to have more sales and connections with nobles, but it was also probably true that he was a step closer to death from overwork. Listen, Benno, any euphemisms are going to go completely over my head. If there's something on your mind, please don't feel you have to mince your words, I said, dropping the noble act while looking over everyone in the room. Benno eyed Fran and Daniel, slowly dropping his act, too. Yeah? I've been getting the impression that I'm loading way too much work onto the Gilberta Company lately. If you think it's too much for you, I can distribute some, some elsewhere. Hey, watch it. I don't need that kind of pity. Plus, it'll just make everyone think you're dropping us, idiot. Are you seriously going to make the same mistake you just made with Ingo all over again? You want to jeopardize the future of the Gilberta Company, too? Absolutely not. I'm not going to let anyone else have this work, no matter how busy we get. Get that into your skull, and don't forget it. As it turned out, lessening Benno's workload wouldn't help at all. The last thing the Gilberta Company wanted was a rumor spreading that they were being cut off. I understand that everyone here shares history, but please do try a little harder to keep up appearances, Fran said with a frown. Benno and I exchanged looks and shrugged. Lady Rosemine, I ask that you continue to grace the Gilberta Company with your patronage. But of course. Now, about today's business. Lady Rosemine, while we're, we were in Haas, you said that you wished to network with Guy Ilgnir. May I ask for more details? Benos asked, his eyes narrowed slightly. A sudden wave of unease washed over me. It was a look that clearly said, Are you seriously trying to load more work onto me? But there was no helping it now that he had warned me not to give those jobs to any other store. I had no choice but to load more onto him. Yeah, dude, you can't have it both ways. You can't have less work and then ha and keep all the work for yourself. You can't have it that way. It doesn't work that way. It turns out that Ilgnir is a mountainous region with an abundance of wood, and there are many species of tree there that I am unfamiliar with. I would like to visit the province to experiment with making new kinds of paper. In other words, you intend to make paper in Ilgnir? Yes, I wish to bring Lutzkill and several great priests for the purpose of making paper. Would that be at all problematic? Benno deeply furrowed his brow. Very. We can't send Lutz on a trip this important without someone else from the Gilberta Company going with him. But no viable options come to mind. I personally can't go on such a long-distance long distance journey given our increasing business with nobles. And neither can Mark, since he's the only other person who can handle that kind of work by himself. His other employees aren't yet, cap weren't yet capable of properly conducting themselves in front of landowning nobles. And while I wasn't too familiar with the Gilberta Company's state of affairs, I could assume that they were low on manpower given that they had needed to borrow the help of priests when selling things in the, ca in the castle. Is Otto not capable of doing business with nobles? A letter from Dad had mentioned that once Otto had completed this year's budget work, he would be quitting his job as a soldier to return to being a merchant. Given that spring prayer was over and we were now halfway through the season, chances were that he already, this had already happened. Otto is perfectly suitable when it comes to his business knowledge, but he has not yet been trained in the mannerisms necessary for working with nobles. He should be in fine interacting with lay nobles, though, right? Even when he was working at the gate, he was entrusted with letting nobles through. The most important thing is just getting used to the new environment. He, would st he could start with lay nobles and work his way up. Even Dad was able to speak properly to the nobles passing through the gate. Nobles would certainly expect more from a merchant than a guard, but I was sure, I was certain Otto could do the job once he got used to it. Why not start by pairing up Mark and Otto? You can provide support when necessary and even bring other trainees around, I suggested. By this point, once I had, even I had managed to learn enough noble mannerisms to get by, if Otto got serious about it, he'd probably be able to act like an arch noble within a single season of practice. Well, assuming he also had a proper teacher, that is. Benno looked between Fran and me, his brow lowered in thought. Could you train Otto and his assistant? Theo, to understand polite mannerisms, just as you trained Leon to be a waiter? Fran, your thoughts, I asked. He had been involved with training Leon, and since the only people in the temple who could teach the mannerisms necessary for dealing with nobles were the great priests who had been trained by Ferdinand, a member of the Archducal family, he and Zom were the only ones out of my attendance suited to the job. Well, I w should be able to make some time for it, since Zom will soon officially become your attendant, Fran mused. I already intended to teach Nicola and Monica proper etiquette, and it would not be a problem for Otto and this Theo gentleman to join them in the orphanage director's chambers. Though, I will only be able to teach them etiquette and nothing more. Then I'll give a light shrug in response. The etiquette is the part that's important. Commoners have no real opportunities to learn how to grade, speak to, or handle things around nobles. 
In the past, Benno had mentioned how tough it had been to find someone who could teach him noble manners. Not even piling up a lot of money could necessarily help him finding one. Thus, as payment for providing such a priceless instructor, I asked for the help of two priceless helpers myself. Now, as payment for this, I asked that you send Mark and Lutz to Ilgnir with me once Otto and Theo had learned their noble mannerisms, as you wish. And so Fran accepted the duty of training Otto and Theo. We would let them know through Lutz when we were ready to start. One last thing, Benno said. Lutz, Gil, give your reports to Lady Rosemine. Yes, sir, they both replied sharply, turning to look my way. They then exchanged a pleased grin with one another before reverting back to their serious expressions to deliver the reports. The new printing press designed by Zach and created by Ingo and Johan has been completed. Wow, I explained, almost leaping out of my chair at the news, but Fran quickly placed his hands on my shoulders to stop me. He pushed me back down with a smile and I directed him and directed me to remain seated. Sorry, I got so excited there for a second, I completely dropped the refined lady act. We would like you to observe the trial run, Lady Rosemine. What would you say what would you recommend we print first? As much as I wanted to rush off and see it right away, everyone was indirectly stopping me. Instead, they wanted me, simply wanted me to provide the base test for something to be printed. Does anything in particular come to mind, Lady Rosemine? Lutz asked, again urging me to answer. I leaned forward. The new printing press exists not for picture books, but books that are filled to the brim with letters. Thus, I would like to focus on text-heavy books for children who have outgrown their picture books. I would use the tales about knights commonly told among nobles to write cool, easy-to-understand stories that showed kids what kind of work they did. And while I was at it, I would have Wilma draw wonderful illustrations with Ferdinand as a model to bring in female customers, practically killing two birds with one stone. All I needed to do was add the classic disclaimer at the start, this is a work of fiction. Any similarity to actual persons, living or dead, or actual events is purely coincidental. It was an iron shield, and I wasn't afraid of Ferdinand objecting. He would take it up as he would take it up. He could take it up in fantasy court. <laughs> Hold on, let me just make sure. Has Ingo finished the letter type cases, the typesetting stand, the composing stick, and the interline spacers? What about Johan? Has he completed the furniture and setting rule? I asked, wondering about the smaller tools that were just as important in the printing process. Let's well, nod proudly. All finished. We also ordered more than enough ink. As soon as we have the manuscript, we can get started. Yippee! Praise be to the gods! What fantastic news, I said cheerfully. I must teach you to use the press and better letter types as soon as possible. You may find that the letter type cases are quite hard to move. I shall go to the workshop and teach you all at once. Lady Rosemine, that is a bit Fran began trying to stop me, but I shook my head at him. I want to use this opportunity to go from typesetting to printing all the way through at least once. I understand that I mustn't do any work myself, but I've been working toward the creation of a printing press for so long now, I want to be the first to touch it. I declared, balling my fist in determination. Fran eventually caved, shaking his head back at me in defeat. Gil shrugged, knowing there was no stopping us now, while Lutz simply crossed his arms. I think Fran and Sir Daniel should allow only a select few into the workshop, granting Lady Rosemine an opportunity to do as she pleases, Lutz proposes. Either way, she'll need to teach us how to use it sooner or later. Let's, I knew it. You understand me better than anyone. I clapped my hands and together, moved by his kindness, only to hear him add that letting me do this would calm me down before I did anything crazy. Mm, maybe he knows me too well. Oh, he does. Once I have the manuscript ready, we can begin testing the printing press at once. Please calm down, Lady Rosemine. At this rate, you will surely collapse. If we start printing right away, I wonder if we can have a volume ready by the summer styrene ceremony. Calm down. You're seriously about to collapse, and if you collapse now, they're never going to let you touch the printing press, Lutz warned. He had switched from his polite language to his usual rough way of speaking when he realized that I wasn't listening and needed to be properly threatened. I gasped, sensing that he was serious. Anything but that. As I took deep breaths to collect myself, the face done by the hidden room's door lit up. Lady Rose, mine, Monica is signaling for you, Fran said. Very well, I should check up on them. I stepped into the hidden room and passed the makeshift screen to where Bridget was. The cheap cloth wrapped around her figure was filled with tiny pins, but it was certainly in the shape of a shapeless, a sleeveless gown, and perhaps due to it being a singular undyed color, it looked entirely like she was wearing a wedding dress. My, how wonderful! It looks incredible on you, Bridget! The dress was on an entirely, in another level entirely from the one she had worn last year. I walked around her, examining it from top to bottom. It must have matched, mostly matched the design I provided, but there were a few awkward areas that caught my attention, probably due to this being the first time Karina had ever made something like this. Let's see. Karina, pinch this dress up around here to better define the chest. You'll also want the back part to look a little more like this. I explained as Karina took out several pins and adjusted their position to alter how Bidget's figure was presented. 
The actual dress would be cut out from fabric with these pieces as a basis, so everyone had a serious expression, in their, a serious look in their eyes. The cloth clung, clung tightly to Bridget's upper body, wonderfully accentuating her curves from her chest down to her hips. Frills had been sewn by her waist, leading to a long skirt that used plenty of cloth. Since Bridget was a knight, the dress needed to emphasize being easy to move around in, so it was deliberately light and thin for how much cloth was being used. Bridget, is this dress uncomfortably tied anywhere? I asked. Not at all. I like how that lack of cloth I like the lack of cloth covering my shoulders makes it easy to move my arms. Plus in emergencies, I could simply cover them with a face stone. Despite how lovely it looked, she was focusing entirely on how convenient it would be during battle. I wasn't sure whether I should praise her for that or beg her to treat the situation at least a little more romantically. As such, as much as I wanted her to use this dress to pin down a wonderful husband, she didn't seem to be thinking about that at all. May I invite Daniel inside? I think that the dress suits you like a dream, Bridget, but I would like to hear the opinion of a nobleman as well. Certainly, I would also like to ask about other female knights wearing this, Bridget replied. She didn't seem opposed to the idea, so I exited the hidden room again. Daniel, would you come with me for a moment? May I ask why? We would appreciate the opinion of a man. Please tell us what you think about Bridget's dress if you would like. Dammy merely blinked in surprise, visibly confused. I know that Bridget would wear the dress no matter, ha matter her own thoughts, since I designed it myself, but there's no point in us making something that does not appeal to noblemen. I would like to hear your frank, upfront opinion as a man, so that we may move forward without such fears. We cannot allow Bridget to bring shame upon herself simply as a result of my own potentially unusual taste in fashion. Don't you agree? At that point, Daniel stiffened before nodding in agreement. In a sense, he had seen more, many of my rampages up close and personal. He knew that I was usually out of sync with the rest of society. If my actions were about to publicly embarrass Bridget, then I'd much rather be stopped by. I'd much rather he stop me now. Daniel is here. Maybe we come. Maybe come in, Bridget. Yes, I'm ready. I entered the hidden room once more. This time with Daniel following behind me. But at that moment, we circled. But the moment we circled around the partition, partition. Partition screen, he froze, letting out a small gasp. Hearing the noise, I turned around and looked up at him. Daniel? He didn't respond. His eyes were open wide in shock, his gaze so fixed on Bridget that he was practically boring holes into her. Then a quiet exhale escaped his slightly agape mouth. He blinked a few times as though he had seen something so dazzling that he was unable to believe his eyes, and his mouth slowly formed into his I'm guessing that's a good thing! <laughs> Oh my god, I swear to god, if those two end up together, I'm gonna laugh. I think I just witnessed the very moment someone fell in love! <laughs> oh dear! Even Karina and the seamstresses had caught on that the motionless Daniel was completely love-struck, and they started looking at him with amused eyes. I could practically hear them say, Spring certainly is the season when love blooms. I urged to grin alongside them, mixed with my desire to push Daniel forward. In my eyes, his feelings were so obvious that he might as well just confess them. So, Daniel, what do you think? Uh, I, uh... Daniel staggered the moment I pulled on his cape, shooting me a surprised look and then blurting out a response. He then quickly turned his gaze back to Bridget. Um, it's, uh, it's quite nice, I think. Don't get all embarrassed now. You need to be more direct and your praise won't get across. Come on, you can do it. I tried silently cheering him on, but deep down I already knew Daniel was kind of a wimp. He averted his gaze, unable to look directly at Bridget, and said nothing more. Everyone else walked on, waiting for him to say something, but his mouth remained shut. The only thing that moved were his eyes as they wandered anxiously around the room. Lady Rosemont's designed this dress specifically for me, but do you think it would be suitable for other female knights as well? Bridget asked, looking down at her dress. Maybe, I think, well... Daniel mustered a vague answer before trailing off, eventually resorting to a small nod. I wanted him to be clearer with his feedback, but love had melted his brain so thoroughly that it didn't seem like he would be of much use here. It seems the dress has passed the test, so we shall go with this design, Daniel. Please vacate the room so that we may complete the fitting, I said, deciding it was best to give up on him for now and shooting him, shooing him out. Once the door was closed, I turned around and anxiously looked at Bridget. His true feelings had been so obvious there was no way she hadn't noticed as well. Um, Bridget... She gave a small, embarrassed smile. Daniel certainly is easy to understand, isn't he? That was the first time a man has ever looked at me like that, so I must confess to feeling a little flustered right now. Nah, 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 nah. You're genuinely stunning, Bridget, and men have definitely looked at you like that before. You just never noticed because they weren't so obvious about it. She probably hadn't noticed because she was too busy thinking about her family, her province, and things to do with combat. Or perhaps she only had eyes for the person she was engaged to. It was bound to be one or the other, if you ask me. Bridget, about Daniel, 
I think he is a fine man with an overall diligent personality. He isn't overly uptight, no doubt due to him being a second son and lacking a title himself. And I do not believe he would even consider attempting to contact Ilgnir, or control Ilgnir. Furthermore, Lady Rosemine, the simple fact that he is one of your favored guard knights makes him a valuable asset to Ilgnir, Ilgnir she replied. As I blinked in surprise at how positively Bridget thought of Daniel, she gave me a bright smile. But the gap between our mana capacity is simply too vast. I am not even considering being with him. Oh, poor Daniel. But his mana is still growing. Maybe it'll be good enough by the time that the books are over and they can end up together, maybe? She had flat out rejected him and with a pretty smile at that, but her words reminded me. Fran Ferdinand had mentioned months before that in order to have children together, two people needed to possess similar quantities of mana. For that reason, I wouldn't have been able to marry anyone as a commoner. It seemed that in noble society, romance was predicted on mana capacity, so a gap too vast would end in romance before end a romance before it had even begun. Daniel fell in love with Bridget and she rejected him almost immediately. This is just too sad. I feel so bad for him. Dude, you've got to work on your mana, dude. Get it up. Because then maybe maybe it'll be enough to not be a big gap. I knew that my blessing was gradually expanding Daniel's mana capacity, but I wasn't sure how much it had grown, nor how much it would need to grow for Bridget to change her mind. Was it possible that he could earn Bridget's consideration by working hard? I thought it over, but I had zero experience with romance and a weak grasp on noble culture at best. The chances were that nothing good could come from me butting my head into the love lives of others, so I would just have to silently cheer him on in my heart. Daniel, if you can somehow close the mana gap between you and Bridget, you might just have a chance. Do the best you can. Please, Daniel, your love depends on it. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to end this off here, and I will see you all in the next one.